all heard of the term IQ, but have you ever heard of EQ? Well, in today's episode of the Keandra Jackson Show, we are going to be talking about emotional intelligence. Welcome back to another episode of the Keandra Jackson Show. I have an amazing topic for you today. We are talking about emotional intelligence. Now, IQ is about your intelligence, but EQ is about your emotional intelligence. Now, this is a term that I feel like is fairly new to our world, to our culture that we haven't talked about as much, but that is going to change after today because I have an amazing special guest expert for you today who is going to break down what emotional intelligence is and get us all together. So my guest expert for today is none other than Farah Harris. She has an amazing book called The Color of Emotional Intelligence and she is the expert when it comes to this topic. It's not only is she an international best best-selling author, but she is a belonging and well-being expert in the corporate space. She is a licensed therapist, and also she has been featured in Essence, Good Morning America, Forbes, and she is a contributing writer for Fast Company. So let's just say, y'all know I don't bring anybody on my show. We bring the best of the best. So please allow me to welcome to the Keandra Jackson Show, Farah Harris. Farah, Farah, Farah. Welcome to the Keandra Jackson Show. I am so excited to have you here with us today because you're one of my faves and I absolutely have to have you on the show to talk about this amazing topic. I mean, the whole episode, we've been talking about EQ, IQ, IQ, EQ, EQ, IQ, and you are the person, okay? You are the absolute plug. When I think of emotional intelligence, baby, I think of you, okay? So you have branded yourself as the EQ lady, and I'm just so excited that you said yes. So welcome to the show, boo. Welcome. Thank you, my dear, for having me. I am so excited to be here. And one, if y'all have not picked up Keandra's energy, it is contagious. Okay. So I'm just excited because I know you about to hype me up. You, you are the caffeine that I needed for the day. <laughs> yes, Keandra the caffeine. Okay. I'm just going to be a drop of caffeine for you. I'm yes. happy. A shot of Keandra. <laughs> that might be something I like to trademark. Go ahead, girl. You can take Anywho. that. <laughs> Anywho, so for the people who have never even heard about emotional intelligence, because as we already kind of talked about, we talked about IQ a lot in this space and in this world, but we don't really talk about EQ. And I feel like that's kind of like a newer topic. Like, I don't remember like years ago or decades even ago where this was a thing. So for the people who've never heard of what emotional intelligence is, can you just break it down in very simple terms? What is emotional intelligence? Well, I'm going to break it down like I break it down to my kids because I don't just teach the adults. I have to teach the children. I can't teach you what I don't live. And so uh, emotional intelligence, I say, is basically knowing yourself and being able to read the room. Are you able to manage your emotions and are you able to assess what is going on in the world around you? How are you landing on people? So when you think about EQ, it's not just about you, it's about you and somebody else. I love this because we gotta break it down to like the most simplest level sometimes. I feel like as therapists, <clears throat> We like to use all the big psychology and therapy words. And people be like, girl, what does that even mean? So I love that you broke it down. Just very simple terms of how you would even break it down to your kids. So I love that. It's about knowing yourself and reading the room. Okay. That also means self-awareness. Mm. Yes. Which is the bedrock of emotional intelligence. And so many people think they're self-aware. <laughs> And the reality, no, they're not. Um, and so I always say, have you asked another person how you're landing on them? Your partner, your kids, your colleague, they'll let you know a little bit more about who you are. So that's why I say people don't like the F word when it comes to elevating their self-awareness. And that F word is feedback. Unless you're giving me praise, I don't want to hear it. But if you going to give me like constructive criticism? Well, maybe, maybe that's not true. Nah, boo. L 
get get the real, get the truth so that you can work on yourself. You know, we run into people who say, well, you know, I've always been that way. Or, you know, I got a high hit. Why? Why do you? Do you understand? And of course, as therapists, we like to dig deep. We ask him, why do you show up this way? <laughs> What's the story behind that? That is that is elevating your self-awareness. Oh my gosh, that's so good. That is so good. She said it's a new F word. We're not using profanity on here. We said F is for feedback. Okay. Yes. So that means hearing what other people have to say about you yes. and taking it easy and not getting offended when somebody calls you on your ish. Now you just went to the next level of emotional intelligence, or shall I say that the, the second pillar, which is self-regulation, you not having an attitude, you ain't talking back because somebody, or, and see, and this is especially for those of y'all, cause I'm a parent of three, the parents out there, when your kids are honest about how you are showing up and you punish them because you don't like what you hearing, you cut them off. You, you know, you, you say things that are not very loving or kind, but could it be just being curious for a moment, could what they be saying is true and taking that moment to self-regulate, which is in healthy ways, you know, practicing the pause, you know, counting the tens. Some of y'all may need to count to a hundred, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, you know, yourself. Or, you know, maybe you need to go for a walk or you may need to listen to some music or something. But some of y'all, and I know, Keandra, you've experienced this. We have also learned how to regulate in unhealthy ways. So that may be passing the pipe. That may be at the bottom of a bottle. That could be, let me see if this person is free. <clears throat> Again, not judging. I'm just saying, has that regulation actually helped you resolve things, helped you to move the needle forward? Has it been productive? So we want to actually find healthy ways to regulate, not unhealthy ways to regulate. I don't even have no words. <laughs> but this is what you do. <laughs> but this is what you do. Because now y'all know if y'all been following Keandra, she will tell it like it is. And so, especially working in relationships, boo, you you need to understand like, okay, why do you keep calling him? Is, is this the is this how you regulate? Or can we find another way to go? Like, maybe I need to be by myself for a little bit. <laughs> I wish so solitude is healthy. Yeah, I wish so many people would take that approach. Just figuring out the why. Let's go deeper. Why are we doing what we're doing? You know, because sometimes mm -hmm. when we get to the root cause of things, it really just helps everything else on the surface. <laughs> we can understand each other better. You can understand yourself better. And you can have those healthier relationships, whether they're romantic, platonic with your kids, with your spouse, with your boo, whoever it is. So mm -hmm. this emotional intelligence that we're talking about with you guys, it applies to all areas, even in the workplace especially that and so like your point earlier where you're saying you know we 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 kind of feel like this is like a new buzzword and and in a way it is like they've they, there's been plenty of research there's uh daniel goldman you know who kind of um i could say catapulted this concept of emotional intelligence but it was like this is for the workplace this is for the leaders this is how you get promoted this is how you perform well and I was like, yo, this is not just a workplace skill. This is a, an essential life skill. And y'all are not talking about it in the breadth and the depth that it really needs to be talked about. Um, but I'm so glad that it's now becoming more and more part of people's conversation. And I'm hoping that the work that I do really gives people better understanding. So it's like, okay, so it's not just a theory you know, this is actually something I can practice in everyday life. You hit it right on the head. So, you know, I love to give like tangible, straight to the point, like tips of like what people can do today. Like sometimes we talk about things and they're like, oh, you got to do this, but it's going to take eight months for you to like, what are some tangible things? What are some core elements? We talked about self-awareness, feedback, all of those things, but what are some tangible things? Like if somebody was looking to be like, you know what? I know my emotional intelligence is on the little lower side. I need to do better and be better. 
what are some things that I can do to kind of like get on that road to improving that? Is there a person that you can ask an honest question? Hey, am I, how am I landing on people? So this, you can find somebody at work. You can find a family member. You can find someone that you know that is not going to coddle you and go like, well, you know, no, get someone. If it's Shirley at work that you know is just straight, no chase, find you a Keandra <laughs> who's going to sit here and go like, okay, I know you probably ain't going to want to hear this, but you know, you actually aren't the best listener. You know, you want someone who's going to give you something that you have to chew on, right? So that you can be able to go like, oh, I really thought I was a good listener, but I'm hearing from five different individuals, you know, three to five people that I'm asking kind of the same thing. Maybe that's something that I should work on. Another thing is that we are not always good at practicing self-awareness because we don't tap into the emotion that we're feeling. So as therapists, we know about this. We're going like, how do you feel about that? Like what's going on? And if you grew up in a family um, or an environment that really did not discuss emotions where, you know, where you were learned, um, learning how to have an emotional vocabulary, like this makes me um, frustrated. This unsettles me. This, you know, besides just the basic happy, sad, fear, you know, angry, but to be able to like, oh, this is unsettling for me. Like if you can't put words to it, then you may need to grow your emotional vocabulary. But another thing we recognize is that for some of us, if that was also our environment, we didn't always tap into how emotions show up in our body. So the, the, the queasy stomach, the constant headaches, right? The, oh man, I'm always getting tension right here. That's your body telling you that you're angry or that you're afraid or something like that. So just slowing yourself down and asking what seems like such a basic question, how am I feeling right now? How does this make me feel is actually not an easy question to actually live out and practice because some of us are afraid of the emotion. You know, we don't want to name it because that means I may have to acknowledge this person hurt me or I have to acknowledge that I have to process through this feeling. And I don't really feel like doing that right now. So I tell people, hey, you know, slow yourself down by asking yourself maybe first thing in the morning as you wake up without judgment how am I feeling? You know, if you're getting ready to deliver a, a presentation in a meeting, if you're anxious, just allow yourself to be anxious. Don't be anxious that you're anxious or frustrated that you're anxious. It's it's a waste of energy, right? When we layer emotions, but then we never deal with the root emotion. So just go, you know, I, I'm nervous right now. Okay. And then right before you go to bed, how am I feeling in this moment? You know what? I, I feel excited. I feel hopeful, whatever it is, so that you can actually decrease the response, the emotional response, uh, and the, and the moment, like you want there to be a small gap. Cause there's some of us will have this emotional response or reaction rather. And then later go like, Ooh, I, I was so mad. I reacted that way. That's because there's too much of a distance. So I'm wanting to help you practice being with your emotions in real time so that it's not this like afterthought where you got to recover or repair because you emotionally reacted in, in an unproductive way. So those are a couple of ways to elevate your self-awareness. Again, since that's the bedrock, that's what I, I would want people to start practicing. I feel like we in church. Pass the collection plate because <laughs> she says to acknowledge your emotions in the moment, the right mm -hmm. now, not later. Like, oh, earlier I fell or like having to, that is so good. I remember back when I used to see clients because you know, I don't, life anymore for therapy uh i used to have this big old feelings chart on mm -hmm. how whip out that was laminated honey because people had a hard time identifying just simple emotions when i say how are you feeling and they'll be like fine i'm like fine isn't an emotion and they're like oh keandra i'm like it's true good isn't an emotion what is your feeling word mm -hmm. and then i'll have to i'm talking about grown adults Okay, I'm yeah. not talking about kids. I'm talking about people who are 30, 40 plus years old. I have to give them the language for them to be able to even know how they feel. Yeah. And so yeah. if I have to do that in therapy, trust and believe there's so many people out there who have to do the same thing for themselves. If you got to get a feeling chart, because they sell them yeah. on Amazon. <laughs> Girl, Google. Google's free. Google. <laughs> there are probably some Google. free tools that you can get it. Um, because it's so true. And then here we are dealing with adults who can't manage their own emotions. 
And then yet we want our kids to be able to be self-regulated. Wow, you're not modeling it. And so I feel like the more we're able to get adults to really practice emotional intelligence, the better the future will be because we will have kids who now see what that looks like and go, when daddy or when my teacher or when my aunt was upset, this is what they did. And so I want to be able to be that way too. I want to be able to practice that. And you know, one thing that I want to let people know, having high emotional intelligence doesn't mean you get it right every time. It doesn't mean that you're cool, calm, collected every time. It means that if you have a low EQ reaction, make sure you rebound with a high EQ response. So if you messed up, Dad, can you say that again? Moment, in the back. Say that again. When you have a low EQ reaction, rebound with a high EQ response. So if you screwed up at at you know the the morning meeting and you talked over Keandra or you you minimized what she said and you take a moment going like, why did I do that? Did I need a Snickers? Did was I hungry or hangry rather? What like what what brought that on, right? And was that fair to her? No, that wasn't. So what do you do? Hey, Keandra, do you have a minute? You know, earlier this morning in today's meeting, I spoke over you and that wasn't fair to you. Um, this is what I got going on with me. And you don't even got to go into the details, but just like own up to it. Because just having that moment of taking accountability will now create a moment where people go, I think I can trust you. Because when you get it wrong, you try to make it right afterwards. And that helps to bring this level of trust and understanding and safety. But when you're constantly having low EQ reactions where you just popping off and you just react into everything and you never take a moment of accountability, people just learn not to trust you. Mm. That's really good. You know, when I was thinking about this, especially since like the, the five love languages and all of these things are mm -hmm. um, online where you can take a test. Is there an EQ test out there that people can take that says, baby, you got a high IQ, you got a low IQ, you in the middle, you off the scale. Like, is there something tangible that people can take to figure out where they're at on this journey? Yeah, so there are several. Um, and I can't think of them, my apologies, off the top of my head, but literally you can type in and Google like EQ assessments and a list will show up. The thing is, I have a, a love-hate relationship with assessments. And it could be my AT my ADHD, where it's like, how many questions? <laughs> like what's the time? But again, I'm still looking at, cause I'm working on building my own assessments, you know, and, and, and evolving the assessments that we create, you know, for corporations. Yeah. Cause I got one now and I'm like, I think this is getting to where I want it to go. So we have our well method access assessment, but because studies have proven that people will rate themselves higher <laughs> in their self-awareness um, it's, I think I want to say it's almost like 80 to 90% people think they're have high IQ who actually don't. That's a large percentage, right? So if you want to go and Google and take some questions, you're going to always want to, well, now I shouldn't say everybody, I shouldn't speak in absolutes, but more often than not, you're probably going to rate yourself higher than you actually are being experienced. So that's why I go to have lived experience data go talk to the people who actually know you. In a way, it's like a informal 360, right? So in your mind going like, okay, these are my top five strengths. I'm an effective communicator. I'm this, I'm that. Okay, now ask your peers, ask your loved ones. What are my strengths? What are my growth edges? That's to me a better barometer for you to measure your emotional intelligence than you know something you find online. Thank you for breaking that down because I know a lot of us, you know, we want something quick. Like, let me go online and just take this test. And then we live by that, right? Where it's just like, that's the definitive thing. And the test told me that I had a high IQ, IQ EQ. And we're just like letting that be the end all be all. But yeah. you're right. Like sometimes the people who know us best can give us so much more data than what yeah. a test, an online test can give you. And so I'm glad that you're creating your own assessment. I'm glad that you are doing all of that because... I'm wondering too, this ain't even under question, okay? but I'm wondering too, especially just like as people of color and I think about just like families and how we've grown up and Farah is Haitian, okay?
I'm spicy from the Caribbean. Yes. <laughs> but also with that comes like Caribbean families are, they set up different, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you definitely can feel it when you um, walk out of your home and then walk back into your home. Cause you, you see like, oh, there's a different way that we address education. There's a different way that we address respect, you know, and how you are to move and, and, and communicate with adults. Um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. And I think like that says a lot too, because if we didn't have assessments that also incorporated culture, right. And things of that nature, then it's just like, yeah. this is the component here. <laughs> you stepping on some toes now because that's that cultural competence we've seen it in in our practices we see it in the field that we're in where we understand some of these theories they make sound good on paper but does it really speak to us as black people does it you know i remember um having postpartum depression after my, my i had it after my first because i was aware of it i was prepared for if it was to show up again in, in a, a you know following pregnancy didn't have it with my second had it really bad with my third. But as a clinician, I knew that that postpartum assessment that you do, I think six weeks after you have the baby, I was like, I will pass this with flying colors. I, But I know I'm struggling with depression, but these questions don't, don't fit how I'm, be, you know, how I'm experiencing my mental well-being. And so I've been, you know, saying, and I, I think you'd agree with this, if a Black woman is constantly telling you she's tired, more than likely she's depressed. Because depression is not going to look the same because culturally we are made to be built as the ones who, well, we just got to keep it together. You just got to stay strong. You be the strong one. You know, I, I don't have time to cry. I don't have time to do this. And so culturally, we can't say we are sad. We can't say, you know, whatever it is that, that shows moments of vulnerability and tenderness all the time. And so with that, you have these high functioning, depressed women. And it's like, well, you gave me an assessment, but I, my experience isn't matching these questions. Yeah. You know, so I think it's very important to recognize like, yeah, most of these assessments, who who did they do this study on? Because if the study it was all on males, it's not necessarily going to be accurate for me. If it's, you know, for for Asians, it's it, it may not work for me as a Latina. In the work that I've done and in the in even pretty much the thesis of my book was that emotional intelligence is going to be impacted by our lived experience, by our cultural backgrounds, by our own identities. And for us to just look at it from one lens, no disrespect to, to the white voices that have brought up this topic of emotional intelligence, but it's so limiting because you don't realize, well, is everybody using EQ the same? Is everybody experiencing um, things in the same way? And we know that the answer is no. That was so good. I mean, I think my final question that I have for you before we play a little game, because you know we got to have a little fun on my show, is mm -hmm. how do you manage somebody who, say for instance, someone has really truly does have like a higher EQ, right? Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with somebody, whether that's a romantic partner, a supervisor, a child, whoever mm -hmm. in your life, and they have a little bit of a lower EQ and they just it's not doing what needs to be done. You know what I mean? So how do you manage those two different perspectives? Because the person who might have a lower EQ may not really even know it because that's just their way of living. So how do you handle that? Oh, that's, that's a question that I often get <laughs> because I think people kind of go, I'm always dealing with somebody with a lower EQ. Um, First question that I ask is, do you have capacity to have the energy to, in a way, almost raise your EQ up? Because we would want to go down. What, what, you know, what does uh, Michelle Obama say? You know, when, when they go low, we go high and people be like, nah, I'll go to the gutter. <laughs> like, they low, they EQ down here. We're going to be down here together. We don't want that. When they go low EQ, we want to go high EQ, but that requires actual energy. Um, you know, so whether you're dealing with a partner, 
uh, who may be more narcissistic, whether we're dealing with a supervisor who is always coming with some type of microaggression, or whether you're dealing with a toddler or child who's having a tantrum, you need to stay regulated. You need to be able to go, Ooh, okay, this person is dysregulated right now. Or this person just said something to me that makes me uncomfortable or is hurtful. How do I make sure that this doesn't spiral into conflict and, and chaos? And so again, if it's an unsafe environment, I would often just say, use your EQ to exit, right? But you know, when you brought up the whole thing about cultural competence and, and everything. So, you know, and I highlighted in my book that especially people who've been historically marginalized, whether you're black, whether you are a woman, whether you're part of the LGBTQ community, we have this higher sense of social awareness, right? So we recognize that we need to keep it together, keep it cool because we do not want to rock the boat. We don't know if we'll lose our job. We don't know if, if certain harm will happen. So we make sure that we're being so socially aware um, and there's this emotional tax that comes with it. So I never want you to do something that causes you to have more of an emotional labor that harms you. So if you have capacity to go like, you know, I'm going to stay here. I know you down here, but I'm going to stay here. Find ways after to kind of like decompress and release because it takes a lot of energy. And so to my parents out there, you understand what I mean when your child is getting on your last nerve, but you like, I understand, Timmy, you don't want to take a bath right now. You're playing, but we have to go. I'll give you two more minutes. Like all of that is self-regulation, not raising your voice, showing that you are in control of your emotions. That takes energy. That's why I say it's not a soft skill. It is a strength skill because it takes strength not to cuss somebody out. It takes strength not to snatch up your child. It takes strength to manage your emotions. So when you are unfortunately experiencing somebody at a low EQ uh, intersection, try your best to keep yours elevated. And if you recognize that it's you starting to go down, exit stage left. That's great advice. Y'all heard that exit to the left, to the left. <laughs> Because if you go low, people say, you know, I go low to the ground. Some people said, I go low. I go all the way to hell. I said, listen, that's too far. Okay. That's true. Why we got to be hot together? <laughs> like, I like air up. conditioning. Like, I like a cool breeze. I don't be in hell with you. I don't want to be in hell, period. That's not even an option. Okay. But this has been so, so good. I know that there's going to be so many people from my network, from my audience who want to stay connected with you. You've mentioned multiple times that you have a book. Please make sure to plug your book. Tell us about your book and where people can stay connected with you. So the title of my book is The Color of Emotional Intelligence. It's that colorful book right here on, on the mantle. Uh, you can buy that at, you know, wherever books are being sold. Uh, if you want to follow and learn more content around emotional intelligence, leadership, well-being, safe, uh, self-care, I put a lot of content on LinkedIn. So if you want to know more about that, you can follow me at Farah Harris LCPC. If you want to learn more about my work? You can visit workingwelldaily.com. I'm also on Instagram, but you know, you you get a little bit of work and a little bit of play on my Instagram, but it's the same handle at Far Harris LCPC. Don't don't look at me like that, Keandra, because you you just play everywhere. I think you do an amazing job on your LinkedIn. I use you as an example for my speaker coaching clients all the time, especially if they are in like corporate wellness settings. I'm like, Go follow her because she's doing it right over there. The branding is right. The testimonials, the content, the picture, I, top notch. And you know, Thank I you. don't be saying that about people if it ain't true. I know. I I 100% know. But, I mean, because your standard is here. I mean, again, for those who've been following Keandra's journey, this woman operates in excellence. And so- and when she teaches you, she tries to do her best on letting you know, like, where do you shine? Because not everybody needs to be on every platform. You want TikTok? Keandra will be on TikTok and will have you learning and laughing at the same time. You ain't going to find fire on TikTok. <laughs> 
one, I just, I, I, I can't, I just, I know where my lane is. There's less traffic there. So I'm better at written content than I am in video content. But she's making me, every time I see a video, I'm being inspired. Like, okay, Far, we need to figure out how to do more video content because Keandra is just laying a beautiful foundation on like what to do. Yes. I want to see you on video, but that's a whole nother conversation for another day. I know. Are you ready to play a fun game with me called Would You Rather and Why? Okay, um, sure. <laughs> Look, y'all, she looking nervous. She looking so, why did everybody get nervous when we play a game? Because you just never know what to expect. You just don't... You're right. With me, you never know what to expect. So, are you ready? Y'all see the branding? I'm just peep, peep the branding. Mm -hmm. Period. <laughs> are you ready? Yes. Okay, so remember this is would you rather and why. So mm -hmm. would you rather live in a world where emotions are above your head, like an emoji, or everyone can only communicate with each other through dancing? <laughs> Ooh, girl, these are some good questions. Yeah. And of course, I'm a visual person. So I'm like literally picturing people like... <laughs> I like it. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um, I'll pick the dancing just because I would think that would be so entertaining. <laughs> oh. Can you stay mad? It's about pop laughing and cabbage patch. You're like, why you always got me? Oh, yeah. To me, that would be complete hilarity. They need to do a movie like that instead of a musical where people, yeah. And I like musicals, so, mm hmm There we go. Okay. The second one, would you rather pause time for 10 minutes each day or mm. rewind by one hour once a week? I would pause time for 10 minutes. Okay. Just because, as I stated, I <laughs> with AD, uh, ADHD, we have this thing called time blindness. And so when you think something is going to take five minutes, it ends up taking three hours. Or when you think something is going to take three hours, it takes five minutes. So to be able to kind of like feel like you can catch up on the time, I would take that. Okay. Got you. And with three kids. Yes. Yes. Okay. And yes. <laughs> would you rather have a personal maid or a personal chef? Oh, that's chef. <laughs> I like to eat and I don't like to cook. I cook well, but I don't enjoy it. And that is literally on my list of things that I wouldn't totally want to delegate to somebody else. Be me. Vacation food, but that's mm -hmm. for another day. Okay. I know. Would you rather deal with mm -hmm. cold weather or hot weather? Is this really a question? You know where I live and where I don't want to be. I am in the Midwest. <laughs> I am in Chicago where it gets cold. I would way rather be someplace warm. What I mean is go ahead and come over to Cali. You know what I'm saying? Get this good old Cali weather. <laughs> I, I need to be someplace else. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And I think it's just the island in me. Like I, the islander in me. I prefer someplace warm. Hmm, that makes sense. It's in your blood. It's, it's in my blood. Your blood. Okay. And last but not least, number five. Mm -hmm. This was hilarious. Okay. <laughs> Would you rather always have B.O., body odor, and not know it? Or would you always want to smell body odor on somebody else? You want to be funky all the time and not know it or smelling on other people all the time? What choose you this day? Oh. <laughs> They're both horrible. They're both horrible. <laughs> because people be talking about you. Like if you got to be out and you don't know it, that's like horrible. How, how can you maintain relationships if you're constantly the one that smells? Now, I think if I had to smell... I think that's what I, I'd rather smell some somebody else and deal with it <laughs> than having be the one that's funky. <laughs> I 
I agree. I absolutely agree with that. See, thanks for playing a fun game of would you rather. It was, wasn't that bad, right? It was not bad. Those are some wild questions, though. Those are probably one of the best questions because, you know, I got to play would you rather with my nine-year-old. And I'm like, you need to holler at Keandra with some better questions. Or some better questions. You got to make it fun and spicy yes. and do something different, not to yes. stuff. So thank you so much for joining me on an episode of the Keandra Jackson Show. It has been a pleasure. You know I'm going to have you back again for part two at some point. So do not be a stranger, but thank you so much for your time. Such a pleasure being here. It was so much fun. Thank you. Woohoo! I told y'all that Far was going to bring the heat. I really hope that something that she shared on today's episode is life-changing for you. Emotional intelligence is something that we all need to incorporate in order to help level up every aspect of our lives. Not only can it improve your emotions, but it also improves how you interact with other people. And, and it is a game changer. Once you learn how to emotionally regulate, it impacts your kids. It impacts how you show up in the workplace. It impacts partnerships. It impacts your family, your friends, your colleagues. It impacts your whole entire life. So I hope that this episode encourages you to get on the right track to leveling up and increasing your EQ so you can show up better, not only for yourself, but everybody who is attached to you. So thank you so much for watching another episode of the Keandra Jackson Show, and I will see you next time. Be blessed. Bye.